Um seminário... Okay. No seminário de hoje, nós temos o prazer de ter o professor Marcelo Fernandes. É, o título é Betting on Conditional Alpha. É, a ideia é uma apresentação de 50 minutos, é, seguido por 10 minutos de Q&A. Uh, todos os microfones estão bloqueados, então quem quiser fazer pergunta, é, manda pelo chat. Tá? Antes de passar a palavra para o Marcelo, eu quero fazer um, uma breve... É a apresentação do, do, SB, do encontro de finanças, que vai acontecer nos dias 16 e 17. Então, nós teremos uma pausa no nosso, nosso Virtual Finance Seminar. Nas próximas duas semanas, a gente retoma no dia 31 de julho. É, para os dias 16 e 17, aqui está uma breve é, um, uma apresentação do que será o nosso encontro brasileiro de finanças esse ano. Vai ser um pouco diferente, eu convido a todos a participar, vai ser gratuito maiores informações aqui pelo site SPFIN. Bom, sem maiores delongas, uh, today we have the pleasure to have Professor Marcelo Fernandes speaking about a paper, a joint paper with uh, Walter Di Tasso and... Uh, uh, Long list. Uh, I'm sorry. So, um, okay, okay, all, all good. So, the idea is to have a 50 minutes presentation followed by 10 minutes Q&A. Uh, if you have any question, please raise your hand and we will open the mic for you ask your question directly. Uh, abu abuse of the seminar will not be tolerated. I hope you enjoy your seminar. If you have also a chance to see our um, Brazilian Finance System Congress it will be held next uh, 16, 17 of Jul July. Here we have the panel prepared for you. If you want to follow and you want to more information, please visit sbfin.org.br. Uh, and that's it from my end. Marcelo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much again for accepting our invitation. It's always a pleasure to hear your, your uh, from you. Thank you so much for, for the introduction. I need to share my screen, so you have to unshare yours, or you can just force that as well. Okay. So, um, which one is the slides are here? And, okay. I hope everyone can see it. So, for those who are not familiar with Zoom, by raising your hand, Alan means that you can go into participants. You click there, and there will appear a column. There will be a raise your hand uh, icon. In you know, by the bottom of the page, okay? So as you said, and probably forgot because the long list of authors, this is a joint paper with Valentina Corradi, Walter Vistazo, and Asgard Lund. And um, essentially it's, a, it's an old paper, which we are wrapping up now because we were not happy at, um, at a certain stage with um, our empirical exercise, so we want to to augment it with more stocks. So we started this paper, I guess, eight years ago with Valentina and Walter. We were the three of us at Queen Mary University of London. And since then, uh, each one of us moved to you know, one direction. So Walter went to Imperial, Valentina is now in Saturday, and I am at São Paulo School of Economics at FGV in São Paulo. But after, you know, for, for three, four years working on this paper, you know, like it's, we thought that we, you know, we, we needed as something a little bit, you know, like more stocks in a bigger cross section in our paper. So we invited um, Asga uh, Lund from Creatis to, to join and uh, to come on board and, and help us with the, all the calculations because it's, you see it's a, it's a lot of uh, things that we have to compute. It takes a lot of time to do all the computation. Okay, so the paper is, uh, is about betting on conditional alphas and I'm an econometrician. So this essentially means that we have to estimate conditional alphas here. And for those who know me, um, what I do is econometric theory, especially non-parametric theory. 
So obviously, what we're going to get is a non-parametric estimates of these conditional alphas. And the way we sell the paper is essentially to look at this big difference between unconditional and conditional uh, CAPMs. But uh, you could use any factor model you, you would like. That's not really a problem. But when you look at the KPM, the unconditional KPM, it's, uh, I think it's kind of obvious by now, it's evident by now that they don't describe very well equity markets. And I don't want to discourage anyone here saying that KPM is not a great model. It is, it, it plays a, a major role in, in finance. If you look at every asset in the economy, you include options and stocks and bonds, it kind of explains very well why stocks get an expected returns that are much higher than, than bonds, why long-term bonds have a much higher expected returns than uh, in short-term bonds. So it does a good job there, but when you go, you don't really need to go into microstructure, but if you just, you know, specialize to one uh, traditional asset class, then it kind of crumbles. And that's especially uh, patent in, in for equity markets. So we have seen from a French, all sorts of models coming with anomalies and, uh, and things that we, you know, we don't, we know how to explain taking uh, unconditional KPM as, as our workhorse uh, model. So essentially when you look at the alphas, you get these non-zero alphas everywhere, you know, and obviously that doesn't mean much in terms of a KPM because the, the absence of uh, pricing error does not suffice to ensure that alpha, the unconditional alpha is going to be equal to zero, right? That's not necessarily the case. It depends a lot on, uh, on time variation, the beta is correlated with market volatility. And with this premium, if you estimate an unconditional KPM, you're going to get an alpha and, and that's alpha, you know, a non-zero alpha. And that alpha can be positive, can be negative. So it, this could be essentially uh, just a misspecification. You're using the unconditional version of the model and not the conditional ones. So once you do this, take this approach, this unconditional approach, the, it's going to lead to all these well-known market anomalies. I'm not going to talk much about them, not going to talk about Fama French. It's going to appear eventually as in almost any empirical asset pricing talk. But one that I would like to, to, to emphasize is the betting against beta from Frazzini and Patterson in Jeffy 2014. And it's essentially a you know, like they show that if you bet against the beta, if you buy stocks with lower beta and sell stocks with higher beta, it's going to give you uh, some extra bucks by the end. It's going to generate alpha. And essentially this happens because the market betas, they display mean reversion. And once you estimate the unconditional KPM, you're essentially saying that beta is, uh, is constant over time. But once you you look at how this beta is evolving over time using rolling regressions or some kind of local average, you're going to see the display quite a big deal of a uh, reversion. So there is a trick, you know, like a, you know, a fix that people in the industry have been using since the 60s, 70s, you know, like the one that starts the mating beta is to use a, a weighted average between the actual estimate that you get and one. And you, if you do that, you get something which looks uh, uh, much more reasonable. And essentially what this uh, regularization is doing is essentially to capture a little bit of mean reversion. And obviously it's not only about mean reversion, it's also about co-movement with market volatility and, and risk premium. And that's essentially why betting against the beta uh, works well. Then there's a paper by Hornstein, I think it's from University of Miami, but it's, uh, it's still a working paper. And essentially it makes, the, the paper makes exactly the same point, but instead of betting against the betas, what uh, he does is to bet against the alphas, right? Obviously there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the betas and the alphas in some sense, if you fix uh, uh, unconditional uh, expected returns. And he shows that if you, if you bet against the alphas, you actually get money, which makes no sense, right? Alpha should be a measure of mispricing, of pricing error, it should be equal to zero if prices, you know, like were fully reflecting all the information. So a positive alpha should indicate that the, the stock is actually undervalued 
and the negative alpha should indicate that the, the stock is overvalued. So you, it would make sense to, to do a statistical arbitrage based on these alphas by taking a long position on positive alphas and taking a, uh, a short position on the negative alphas. And what Bornstein shows is that actually you should do the opposite. You should buy the stocks with uh, negative alpha and you should sell the stocks with uh, positive alphas, which shouldn't make much sense if alphas are indeed reflecting uh, pricing errors. So our paper is essentially in contrast to this field of betting against alphas or betting against betas, because now we're not going to take any more the unconditional perspective. We're going to come up with a conditional model, a conditional KPM, a conditional multifactor model. And then I'm going to show you that the pricing errors that we're going to cover so our measure of conditional alpha, actually if you bet on them, you can get some, something out of it. So kind of uh, justifying, warranting the interpretation that what we are estimating are actually pricing errors. Okay, but so the usual things, yeah, please. Like pricing errors could get larger as well, like depends on the frequency of measuring maybe or um, because like, I don't know, maybe the pricing errors are not necessarily revert immediately, yeah, so. Um, True, not necessarily. So that's what we're going to see. And uh, I'm going to come up with two strategies and they, and they are going to have very different features. And then, uh, and then we can talk about interpretation and whether this makes sense or not. Okay, so to start with, uh, you know, I, I said in the introduction, I'm a non-parametric guy, but uh, obviously we have to, to give some, um, some credence to, to parametric econometrics as well. So instead of uh, starting with um, non-parametric right away, let me talk about the usual fix. The usual fix, once you move to, from unconditional to conditional models in, in asset pricing models, is to, is to make both alphas and betas in a multi-factor model to to be affine functions of stock market, you know, stock characteristics. That's the, the typical thing that we, we normally do. So you would take and say that alpha is um, Z times some, some vector parameters theta, and you would say the beta is going to be the same Z times another vector of parameters phi, whatever. And normally this, these instruments to scale the payoffs are stock characteristics, interest rates, you know, credit spreads, term spreads, business cycle indicators, and things like that. And, and that's the usual fix for a reason. It's extremely easy to estimate that because in some sense, you are still in the multi-factor uh, world, right? It's, it's just OLS, right? You know, you, instead of having, you know, alpha plus beta, the, the market portfolio, now you're going to have the alpha not plus uh, a vector of alphas times the z, then you're going to have the market portfolio, and then you're going to have the interaction between the disease, the instruments, and the market portfolio. It's still a linear model in, in the parameters. It's very easy to estimate, very easy to interpret, and the fit is much better. It, it actually works very well. Wayne Ferson has a, a whole bunch of papers about that, a dozen at least, you know, exploring all the avenues you can think of, of conditional uh, betas and conditional alphas using this affine structure. Though, actually, in theory, you couldn't really do that, right? If you have an affine structure for the betas, then the alphas and the betas should be related. There's a nice paper by Patrick Gagliardini and uh, Osola and Olivier Scaillet in Econometrica a few years ago. And they essentially show that there's this link and essentially when you do that, you're kind of uh, ignoring this link. But you know, it's a, it's a good approximation in the sense that if you look at the pricing errors, the non-zero pricing errors, they kind of um, reduce by half at least, right? On an average in terms of magnitude. So if you want to summarize this literature, you know, like if as Wayne Ferson has, has done in the past, there are three stylized facts. Market betas, they indeed vary over time and they vary a lot and there's a huge 
risk aversion, sorry, the PE reversion, as I said before. Pricing errors are still varying over time and they're still non-zero, even though the magnitude decreases a lot once you move from the conditional to the conditional, uh, conditional versions of the KPM. So there's a whole bunch of paper, papers about that. I'm go not going to spend much time on that. So what are the questions that we are interested in? So there are questions about methods um, and econometrician, so that makes sense. And as a non-parametric guy, the first thing that I would, uh, that I would ask is, would wonder, is whether this affine specification is flexible enough or not. The second one is about the optimal sampling frequency. It seems a, a kind of stupid question, but uh, it doesn't seem a very interesting one, but for methods, it's, it makes a difference. If you want to estimate beta or volatility, right, any risk measure, what you really want is to have very, very high frequency. That's going to give you a, a huge extra mileage of, you know, where you can go, precision, and, and we know that because, you know, if you take a, a continuous time process, a continuous uh, time diffusion process, and you want to estimate the, the diffusive part, so the volatility, could it be stochastic or not, um, if we had continuous record of the data, so data at continuous time, then we would need to estimate the, the variance. You would know it, right? So obviously, as you increase the number of uh, the, the frequency of the data, the sampling frequency, you're always going to get a better estimator of the of risk or the core risk in the case of beta. But on the other hand, if you're estimating alpha, what you need is time span. Frequency is not going to help you. You would like to have 100 years of data. You don't want to have a couple of years of data, even if you're looking at the one second or at the nanosecond frequency and you have millions and millions of data points. That doesn't help to estimate alpha. So, you know, perhaps it's abuse of notation to, to call it optimal sampling frequency, but that's something that uh, you were interested in. And then obviously, once we estimate these conditional alphas, there are all sorts of questions that you can ask. What are the main drivers? How persistent they are? How predictable they are? I think they shouldn't be too, too predictable, right? Because if they are very predictable, that's, that, that seems like easy money on the table, right? So it, it can't be too predictable. They should appear every now and then if, if you believe that markets are near efficient, right? But they, they are not persistent at all. If they are random, they are just noise, so they, they make no sense. So they, they, they should be some predictable there, but not much. And obviously, the next question is uh, whether batting on this conditional alphas is profitable or not. If you want to interpret them as pricing errors, I think that, you know, obviously there are limits to arbitrage, but uh, it makes sense to ask this question because if they are price, if they are indeed genuinely pricing errors, you know, arbitraging away them should give you some profit. So the focus here is a little bit different from the literature, you know, if you come back uh, one slide and, and look at this whole bunch of papers here in the, on the bottom, they are all essentially about risk premium and they are not really interesting in the pricing errors. So the focus here is, is pretty different. We don't really want to test any asset pricing model. We, what we want to do is to uncover these pricing errors and try to, to see whether we can actually view them as pricing errors, these pricings, and, and, and whether our estimates make sense. Okay, so here we, as we are not interested in the risk premium, we are not going to make any attempt of modeling uh, conditional betas. We are going to take a realized approach, so we are going to take uh, advantage of high frequency data to estimate these uh, realized betas. And we know that, you know, if the number of observations, the intraday observations within a day, they converge to infinity. So we need that if you do an infill asymptotics, if you move from discrete time to continuous time, you would actually get the, the, the true beta, you know, in, uh, of that day. So there is a, a whole literature about that. It started in the 90s, so it's, a, it's already uh, two decades that we have been uh, 
that have been aware of the, this realized approach, even though it started back in the 80s. So that's what we are going to do. We're going to, to get rid of the conditional betas by taking a realized approach. And from there on, we are going to try to estimate these conditional alphas. So let me give you the empirical strategy in one slide. And that's the main takeaway lesson if you are essentially uh, interested in financial econometrics. So what are the ingredients here? We have stock price that evolve in continuous time, but we have state variables that evolve in discrete time. And these discrete, these state variables are essentially going to define, determine the drift and the, and the stochastic covariance matrix of these uh, uh, stock prices. So the drift and the diffusive components, remember this is a multivariate model, so the drift is a vector, the diffusion uh, component is a stochastic uh, covariance matrix. These are going to be measurable functions of the state variables. So this means that the state variables evolve in discrete time. This means that the drift and diffusion are going to evolve in discrete time. In practice, what we say is that stock prices are moving in continuous time, but the fundamentals are moving in daily. You know, you could choose the whatever simply interval you want, as long as it's a lower frequency. And essentially we have to, to keep track of this drift and diffusion components, which are obviously are going to give, uh, are going to give way to the, to the betas and the alphas. We have to do that uh, in a lower frequency, not at the intraday, but in a, in a daily frequency, okay? Identification is, is very simple. We estimate the realized betas because we know that this is going to give us consistent estimator of the conditional betas. And then we adjust returns for risk. By that, I mean, you just take the returns and subtract the beta times the, the market portfolio. Once you do that, you're going to have on the right-hand side, just conditional alpha plus the innovation, right? The innovation is, is innovation. So by definition, this conditional expectation of this innovation has to be zero. So anything that, that differs from zero is going to, to appear in the conditional alpha, okay? So essentially what we're going to do is to take uh, the conditional expectation of the risk adjusted return and estimate that, right? So any deviation from zero has to be the conditional alpha. So that's the, essentially the, the key uh, aspect of our identification strategy. Uh, innovations here are independent of the conditioning state variables, you know, normal assumption when you do OLS and, and things like that. So backing out uh, pricing errors by estimating conditional expectations uh, is, is just kind of natural way to do that. So there is a, a huge related literature. I'm not going to, to, to you know, delve into empirical asset pricing and all the models that people have been doing. So in econometrics, at least, there are two literatures that are, that I think that are very interesting. So one is about integrating observations at different sampling frequencies. The people doing macro normally do MIDAS, so they, they want to estimate on the left-hand side something which is at a lower frequency using higher frequency on the right-hand side. We are not really doing that. What we're doing is to use intraday observation to, to estimate a co-movement in, in, uh, in, in stocks and with market portfolio. So this is not exactly new. You know, we are not the first ones of doing that. Actually, with Valentina and Walter, I have a, a couple of papers, one in 2012 in Journal of Econometrics, another one in 2017 in JASA, doing that for, you know, looking at causality and volatility transmissions and jump transmissions and things like that. But if you actually, you know, know a little bit about the literature, it actually starts with a, a paper in 87 by French, Vert, and Stanbound, where essentially they say, well, we are looking at uh, monthly data, stock market data monthly, and then they, they just take the daily returns and they accumulate the square of the daily returns and say, well, this is the variance within that month. Uh, obviously, this is not the, a proper way of doing it. If you believe in asymptotic theory, if it's an infill asymptotics, you know, you need to have really high frequency, but that's, that's where the idea comes from. I think Merton, the 80s, have already said something like that. French work and some of the first to do that. And then um, Giselle, Santa Clara, and Volkanov with uh, their MIDAS approach, they started doing that in 2005. So there's a, 
a whole bunch of people doing that with volatility, but also there, is, there are people out there doing a lot of data analysis using this realized in approach that integrates observations at different sampling frequencies. Um, and then there's also a, you know, a couple of papers talking about non-parametric alphas and betas, these conditional versions of the alphas and betas, and essentially they are local estimates. And, and there you, you take your local estimate of choice, right? So Lulin and Nagel are not exactly econometricians, so they do rolling regressions. Fair enough, right? So Li and Yang uh, have a, a similar paper. Ang and Christensen, Christensen, Chris, uh, Chris Christensen is a, uh, is uh, that's right, Dennis Christensen is an econometrician. So it's a, a little bit more convoluted. They use kernels to, to reproduce what uh, Llewellyn and Nagel do with rolling regressions. They kind of uh, formalize that. But the problem of these papers is that, is that you know, it's a descriptive analysis, right? You cannot really say much about that. You're essentially conditioning on time as if you were putting, you know, like tiny dummies, you know, for each time you would have a dummy and then estimating these parameters. But you cannot say much about what is driving these pricing errors. You cannot really set, tell much about, you know, portability of these alphas. So that's where we think we can contribute. So let me quickly go over the roadmap for today's talk. I'm going to start from continuous time. I'll move to discrete time. You have to be careful there. So I think this is a part that, uh, that Alan is going to have a, a great fun because that's what he, 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 he does. Then I'm going to talk about conditional alphas, how we estimate. I'm going to quickly pass through the synthetic theory, you know, for the, the sake uh, of the audience. Then I spent most of my time talking about these prices in the US equity markets. I think the first version of the paper, we had only the S&P 100, and now we have like a, you know, 4,000 stocks. You know, it's a, it's a much more interesting empirical exercise. And I'll quickly talk about trading these pricing errors and how to build a, a, a strategy, a trading strategy before offering my concluding remarks. So let me, any questions up to here? I'll give five seconds and done. So from continuous to discrete time. So our procedure essentially relies on high frequency data in this realized approach. So this, this means that we have to be very careful with, our, uh, with what we assume in continuous time because it has to satisfy all the conditions that we need for the estimation, right? So, in particular, it has to be a special semi-martingale, which is actually comforting because that's what we normally require if you want to have no arbitrage. So what are the main issues? The, the main issues are there too. Uh, as I said, synthetic theory requires semi-martingales in continuous time, so we have to ensure that, and that's not so trivial as we thought, but I actually thought it would be trivial to show that but it's not, given that we have this uh, conditioning on these state variables evolving at a different uh, frequency. And the second problem, which actually I, I thought would, I also thought it would be easy, is the exact discretization. Because we're going to move from, from continuous time to, to discrete time, so we want to have an exact discretization to understand exactly what is going on. And if you start with a continuous KPM and discretize, you don't get a, a continuous KPM. Actually, what you get is a multi-factor model. So it's, we didn't want to go into there. So, so we have to come up with a, a continuous time process that makes sense that once we discretize, you get exactly um, a conditional version of discrete time of the KPM. So here's the starting point, you know, although I'm going to talk about KPM the whole time, you know, you can do that with uh, a number of factors, you know, a vector of factors, you know, the, the, the strategy is exactly the same. And I can talk a little bit about the, the estimation part with factors instead of KPM, if you, but it's, it's, uh, it's straightforward. That's in Zahalia, in, in a series of two papers, I've been dealing with that, how you do this uh, uh, principal components and with factors and how to, to, you know, to build up these kind of things. So it's essentially straightforward. Just trust me if we don't have time to, to talk about that. So prices here for each I, I goes from one to N. This is N assets that we have. 
they are going to have a drift and obviously we can't really estimate this drift non-parametrically. There's no way in hell you can come up with a non-parametric estimator for of the drift. You have to impose some kind of parameter like some parametric constraints on on the diffusive part and the, the transition distribution if you want to come up with a parametric estimates of the drift. So we're not going to touch it. So, but we don't actually need it, right? So you have the drift here, it's changing over time. You see everything depends on T, not on S because S now is my, uh, denotes the time in, in, you know, in the continuous time, right? Whereas T is going to be say like a day, for instance. So day S is, is the, the, the time passing from the start of the day t up to the end of day t, and then it starts t, day t plus one, right? So t here is denoting a lower frequency and as the, the higher frequency, which is essentially continuous time. Okay, so the drift actually depends on information that uh, from time t, so the, from the beginning of the day. So the day starts and, and then you have a drift, and that's going to be the drift for the whole day, for the whole training day. And the same thing goes for this, this stochastic uh, uh, covariance matrix here, which for this, all these Brownian motions that each one of them relates to each risk factor that you have. And then you have an idiosyncratic uh, risk coming about here. You also have a stochastic volatility here. It could be stochastic, it could be deterministic, that doesn't matter much. And then you also have uh, a lot of motions for the, for the factors, you know, and they also satisfy a continuous time uh, diffusion process with both drift and stochastic covariance matrix depending on the information at the past t. So whenever we write this t here, this essentially means is a, an abbreviation, a short way to write this, that you can condition these drifts and the diffusive components essentially on these state variables Cp, right? And uh, we are going to assume as well, as this is a disocratic risk, that these two guys are essentially uh, independent or uncorrelated, given that they are normal. So this is the first part. We were kind of worried with the semi-martingale um, semi martingale property that we have to satisfy. And essentially, lemma one says, okay, no problem. You can have these state variables in discrete time and everything is going to be all right. You still have a semi-martingale and we were ha very happy with that, right? And uh, I'm not going to go into details. So, uh, and essentially what you, come, you can do now with that model is to come up with exact discretization, discretize that exactly. And then in the end, what you get is a continuous time multi-factor model where these little Fs here, they relate to the big Fs. So if you have only a single factor, this becomes a single factor as well. And you can give uh, names for these alphas and for these betas, you know exactly how to, uh, to retrieve them from the original parameters, even though we're going to estimate everything non-parametrically, okay? So we, we understand very well what we're doing. But the nice trick here is that this beta is actually constant over the day. And it changes from one day to the other, but not within the day, right? And this is, this is crucial, it's paramount. A lot of people in this realized beta literature, they try to get away with this assumption, but actually it's an implicit assumption. You really need it, otherwise you're not really going to estimate uh, the realized beta. And the reason is simple. If you look at the destinator of the realized beta, essentially looking at this intraday variation in the factors, Right, the intraday variation, the factors and the prices, and you're estimating kind of a covariance here, and on this side, the variance of the factors. So essentially the numerator here is going to converge to the integral of these, and this guy is going to converge to the integral of this. So this is going to converge to the integrated covariance, and this is going to converge to the integrated variance, but actually the realized beta should be integrated beta and not the the, the, the ratio between these integrated. So the integral should be for the whole ratio and not for each one, for the numerator and denominator separately. It's only going to be equivalent if you have a constant beta over time, okay? So that's exactly what we're assuming. Then once you estimate this uh, realized beta, you can risk adjust the return. So the, the return that you get minus the risk premium that you were expecting and its exposure to that risk premium. 
and what remains is essentially the condition of alpha, the innovation, and some obviously some sampling error because we don't really observe the realized, uh, sorry, the condition of beta, but we can only estimate that using a realized approach. Okay, so now we have to retrieve these uh, pricing errors from the realized betas, and the way to do that is it's simple. We just have to take a conditional expectation of the Z, so these risk-adjusted returns, giving our state variables uh, CT. And once you do that, you, get, you should get the alphas, right? You can do that parametrically. Typically, you would assume an, uh, an affine function on the CTs, which is easy to estimate, but obviously, you know, the usual uh, cheap shot from non-parametric uh, econometricians uh, holds there is a, a high specification risk when you do that. So what we do is to take a non-parametric approach. We think it's more flexible, it's robust, right? Because you know it could it could have it, it could capture non-linear effects as well. But obviously there's a price to pay, and the price to pay is the curse of dimensionality. We cannot have too many factors, sorry, too many state variables. Otherwise, it's very difficult to estimate this uh, condition expectation. And once you do it non-parametrically, you have non-trivial measurement errors as well that we would like to control for, and that complicates a little bit the synthetic theory. So what we're going to do? So we're going to estimate by a kernel regression, you know, easy peasy, you know, there's nothing very particularly uh, difficult about that. To take care of the curse of dimensionality, when we look at all these conditional state variables, we are essentially going to assume, uh, take a principal component between them. That's not really what we envisioned at the beginning. We thought that we could use uh, some single index, some sliced inverse regression or regularization, but actually we realized that if you use any sort of regularization, essentially you have to assume implicitly that these alphas have to be non-zero. And we didn't, we, we want to give a chance. We didn't thought it would be fair not to give a chance to, uh, to a correct uh, specification in which there are no pricing errors. So that's why we, we kept everything as a principal component. And for the, the measurement error, we show that essentially we provide conditions, right? That if the number of intraday observations is sufficiently high, sufficiently large as compared to the the number of observations in the time span, then they realize the beta estimation error is going to be negligible and we can just ignore and treat it as if we were actually observing the conditional uh, betas. So there is an asymptotic theory. We use essentially the, the usual assumptions. There are moment conditions for the drift and diffusion, uh, diffusion terms. There are moment conditions for the risk adjusted return, strict stationarity. It cannot have too much of dependence over time, so alpha, we use alpha mixingness, but we, we could have assumed that beta mixing doesn't make much of a difference. But in, in any way, we don't expect these uh, conditional alphas, these pricing errors to, to, to last long in a way. So there are the usual kernel conditions that you have to, how you select the kernels. Once you define the kernels, you, these also impose conditions on the bandwidths that you have to use. And anyway, uh, as the, we have to do this conditional expectation on CT and, and this conditional state variables are stochastic process as well, to establish uniform uh, result over the support, essentially we have to use some training as well. So we essentially we have to ensure that this uh, denominator here, we can always estimate it. So we cannot go into regions where this guy is too small, otherwise this, this is going to skyrocket the estimate of the alpha at that particular point. So we need uh, observations on these guys. So we kind of trim and we, we are always looking at the alpha estimates when we are close to the, to the bulk of the data for these conditional state variables and this gives a lot of discipline <coughs> for, your, for our estimates. Okay, and then we have a synthetic theory showing that everything goes on beautifully and the rates, I'm not going to talk much about that. Let me talk a little bit because it, I have, think I have like 10 minutes or so, perhaps a little bit less. Yeah, 10 minutes to talk about uh, uh, the empirical exercise we do. Essentially, we take, uh, you know, 17 years of data. 
yeah, 17 years of data from January 2001 to December 2017. We used the first two years, more or less, <coughs> and we burned them, like the first 500 observations, just for the estimations, because obviously it takes time to converge, it's one parametrics, right? We need a lot of observations. So the, our first estimate is at observation 501, which I think is 16th of January 2013, something like that. And, and so we burned the first 500, and everything else is going to be based on this uh, over 2,500 observations from January 2003 to December 2017. We used the entire cruise database, right? So it includes stocks at Amex, NASDAQ, and NISA. We do some the typical filters that normally we do. We, we eliminate some penny stocks. We want to have a, um, liquid stocks, you know, and for that we only take stocks, you know, for, for each day, we only consider stocks with uh, at least 78 observations. And this means essentially one observation on average every five minutes. And once we do that, we, we have about 2000 active stocks, right? The daily average is about uh, 1400 stocks by over the whole time span, you know, a little bit more than 2000 stocks. The market portfolio is going to be proxied here by the spider, SP500 exchange traded fund, SPI. We want to have something which was investable. We try to use SP500 and uh, futures. It doesn't make much of a difference. You know, like the estimates are, uh, are pretty close in terms of realized beta, essentially because the spider does a great job tracking the, the SP500. And then as instruments, as I said, we use um, change, sorry, I didn't say that, but the instruments, so the, the conditional state variables here are the chains in the VIX, in the volatility index, Fed funds rates, so the changes in the Fed fund rates. We look at the volatility risk premium. So we take the, no, I, no I'm not sure, I think it's the variance, the variance risk premium. So we take the difference between the the physical volatility, the realized volatility, uh, minus the realized, uh, sorry, minus the, the VIX, and this gives an idea of the variance risk premium. We look at uh, FAMA French factors, you know, all of them with the maximum five, five, uh, five factors. We look at momentum reversals, long-term and short-term reversals, credit and term spreads. Ideally, we'd like to have everything that um, people normally use to model this premium. Obviously we cannot do because uh, this is at the daily frequency and most of these, uh, the literature on this premium look at monthly uh, data and you have you know, things that evolve at the monthly uh, frequency. So uh, this is everything we could get that uh, you know, we have data on, uh, on a daily basis. We tried liquidity as well and a couple of uh, and other stuff, but these are the ones that remain in the end. To estimate the realized betas, we use a multivariate realized kernel with refresh time. If you don't really, you know, if you're not really keen on financial econometrics and don't know this literature, just forget about it. It's just the state of the art to estimate these realized betas. And we try to do some rescaling as well to deal with overnight returns. In particular, I was, you know, you know, I was happy enough with uh, open to to close uh, returns, but my co one of my co-offers now, I want to have the open to open and include the overnight. So we had to change, to, you know, to do some modifications in what people have been doing in the literature to, to include the overnight returns. But again, the results do not vary too much once you move from open to trade to open to open. They just get a little bit more volatile. So let, let me just give you a summary of how the realized betas look. There is a lot of daily variation, the exposure to market risk. The graph I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you just the quantiles. So you don't see as marked as we see this variation because you're looking only at the quantiles, how the quantiles are varying. And obviously it's, it's not the same stock in the, in, the, in the quantiles. So there's a lot of variation, exposure to market risk. And this contradicts a lot what Lulin and um, Nagel's uh, say in their paper, they, they claim there is not enough monthly variation market betas, and that's why they use uh, 
we estimate variation over the months instead of over the days as we do. And there's also cross-sectional dispersion that is increasing over time. We can see that you know, in a very neat way especially if you include overnight returns, then the, the right tail variation increases a lot, especially after 2008. There is some weak movement in the daily realized beta. There's not much movement going on here. So if you take the three, the first three principal components, they explain about a third of the overall variation, not, not so great. And they are very persistent over time. So there is evidence to some extent of long range dependence. And there, there's a lot of mean reversion, as uh, I said in, right in the beginning. So that's how the quantiles look like, right? So obviously, as you move towards the middle, you get the, the, the conditional median, and then you get the, the in, in red, I think it's like one, no, I don't remember. I think in red, you get 25 and 75, so the interquartile range in my Magenta, you get something which is the 90% range, so 10 and, and 90. And, and then finally, you get 99, I think, in, the, in this uh, other color here, which I don't know how to define, probably because I'm a man and, and, and we, don't, uh, we don't know the names of the colors. So this is for perfect to close, and this is... No, apparently it's a scientific thing that uh, men cannot, uh, our eyes cannot see as many, you know, as many colors uh, as women can. Uh, but a quick question, like uh, talking about the betas, when you, you first mentioned I thought, that I thought it, uh, it was not I about, it was the about the colors. <laughs> it was about the betas. <laughs> okay. So, like you mentioned that the betas vary a lot, but at least when re my uh, memory uh, using the similar data that through yours and basically, I guess it's basically the same one, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of this variation is not persistent at all. So maybe part of it is, uh, is noise, yeah? Oh yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I think most of it is noise. Once you take, uh, if you smooth them out of weight, but they still vary a lot, you know, I vary a lot in the sense that uh, Nagel and uh, Luren and Nagel, they say they don't, they don't vary much they don't vary but it doesn't at all it, they vary yes. yeah. but it does i don't know if it varies a lot in a persistent way on a daily frequency. no they don't yeah. they don't they just have a, a well actually no actually they do if you look at the here can be different yeah so. if you look at the the doubt correlation function it's very persistent so up to 200 likes you still have a some dependence, some significant uh, autocorrelation. Yeah. But we're talking about so many data points that everything is persistent as well. Everything is significant yeah. and important this way. Okay. So this is open to close. So it's very from minus one to, to five here, right? And, and once you, you can see that it doesn't, it doesn't get into, like you get all this white region here where it's not being visited. It gets visited by the end. And this is what I meant about um, the increased uh, variation by the end of the series. Once you go from open to close to close to open to open, so you include the overnight, then you get much more variation because the overnight is just like a jump. This is going to decrease a lot the the, the autocorrelation. So it's much less persistent now because you include these this big jumps coming from the overnight. So you have much less uh, uh, persistence, but you get much more variation. And you can see that since the beginning, you get this, this faded orange color coming about here and up here. Okay. How about the alphas? Well, there is, the cross-section of dispersion is much more erratic. And uh, so this means there's not much persistence going on, but there's a, a great deal of volatility clustering. So when you look at them, it looks like a return, right? And it's, so it, it's very small and then suddenly it has like some big variations there. But, uh, you know, whenever you have big variations, it tends to be followed by big variations. Whenever the variations are small, it tends to be uh, followed by small variations. And actually what we get is that the non-parametric estimates, they are pronouncedly different from the, from the affine estimates. And, and, the, and the reason is, is kind of obvious, right? 
in the variables that we use for the conditional state variables, they, they show they display some kind of persistence. Once you do an affine model, the, 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 the alpha estimates are going to inherit all that persistence. If you do a non-parametric model, then there is no inheritance because the non-parametric uh, way of estimating these local averages are essentially going to kill any kind of uh, persistency. Uh, so, it, so the non-parametric alphas are going to be much less persistent than their fine estimates. The non-parametric alphas, they... I got a bit here. So uh, the conditional variables that you're using there uh, for the alphas are the ones that you had in the list that, that the instrument list or? Yeah, that's yeah. the instruments. That's exactly um, what we do. But you're not using firm specific information at all. It's more like everything is a, uh, so in some sense you're capturing, potentially capturing uh, common mispricings. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So what exactly what we want to do is to exploit the idiosyncratic mispricings. So that's what we want to do. So here we go. So we have much larger pricing errors if you do the non-parametric estimates, and this could be essentially because of noise as well. There's no guarantee that uh, what we do non-parametrically is, is actually better. If you had an, uh, a huge data set, obviously we know that it should converge to the true, uh, to the true alpha, whereas the affine estimate will only converge if they, they are indeed uh, affine. And this is especially true for 2008 to 2010, when you got, we got it, you know, essentially the, the crisis, the aftermath of the crisis. And as I said, they are much less persistent. But despite the fact that they are less persistent, they have much more predictability. So they are fine estimates. They, are, they correlate contemporaneously with returns. Whereas the, the non-parametric estimates, they have like some, uh, they, they predict future returns with correlation up to 2%, which is very small, but very significant at this, at this frequency, up to four days ahead, okay? And there are, and if you look at the conditional alphas as compared to conditional betas, there is much more, you know, mm -hmm. movement. So if you take the first three uh, Principal components, they explain about 45% of the variation in the non-parametric alphas, but 87% in the fine alphas, essentially because of this persistency. Then we also break down by liquidity, market cap, and, and, and you, you can see that the magnitude is larger for less liquid stocks for small caps. So this is how they look like. So this is their fine. You see they're in the same scale, so it's easy to compare the, the larger magnitude that you get here, but they look like returns, right? You know, like very close to zero, which I mean, essentially say there, there's no pricing error, then the pricing error appears. Here is essentially when, when we had the crisis and so on. And you just magnify that when you go to the non-firm metric. This is for smaller caps, so you see much larger variation. This is for larger caps, much less variation. So it goes more or less in line with what we would expect. And these are the, the, the persistence that you ask. So this is for betas, this is for alphas. So you start for the linear, you inherit the persistence of the conditional state variables. So it starts there at 0.4. It's kind of pretty high, right? I didn't expect so much. Whereas if you do the non-parametric way, you get 0.1 of autocorrelation, which seems more in line if you are thinking about pricing errors. For the beta, it's much higher, right? For the uh, open uh, to close, so without including the, the overnight returns, you get something coming from 0.45 and you go like 50 legs and you're still persistent. If you go up to 200 legs, then you, you start uh, killing this autocorrelation. Whereas if you do the, if you include overnight returns, obviously what happens is that you are including a big noise, a big jump, and this is going to decorrelate uh, these guys uh, over time and then you get much less persistent. So let me show now very quickly, I think in the last couple of minutes I have, if I have some, uh, a little bit about trading pricing errors. Okay, so the long short trading strategy here is going to be very simple. We're going to buy stocks with a very high alpha and sell stocks with low alpha. 
and what is very high, what is very low. Well, we use deciles and then we use quintiles and you can take your stand, you know, like I'm going to show you the size and how quintiles uh, look like, but it, you know, quintiles are a little bit better than the size. We sh should probably sell it as, as quintiles, but we started with the size and didn't want to change the, the paper just to do cherry picking, right? And we have like daily rebalancing, longer holding periods, because obviously if you're rebalancing every day, your transaction costs increase, increase a lot. We're going to do a fine alphas, non-parametric alphas, and we have also an exercise that I'm not going to show about appraisal ratios, which essentially take alphas and divide by the, the, the standard idiosyncratic risk, which essentially gives you kind of a T-stat. And um, because we were worried with alphas that were larger, but without any significance. So we try to do the appraisal ratio, but you know, the results are more or less the same. So uh, I'm going to skip that. It's a self-financing strategy. We have equal weights in the long and the short portfolios, and then we can have both equal weight or value weighted uh, portfolios you know, in, when you combine the long and short. We can do expanding window, or we can do rolling window of 750 uh, trading days. It doesn't make much of a difference. We do with and without risk-free adjustment, because you know, like the equations I've shown you, I didn't uh, take excess returns, so I was using just the raw returns, you can do excess returns as well and kind of adjust. It doesn't make much of a difference as well because obviously the risk-free is not going to affect much the, the quantiles, right? It's the same risk-free rate for every stock. It doesn't affect much the quantiles. So in the end of the day, it doesn't make much of a difference. And we try different amounts of trimming as well, right? How, how much we trim. And again, the trimming is very important. As long as you do some trimming, the results are qualitatively the same. If you don't do any trimming, then you get, you know, hell breaks loose. You can have estimates of alphas everywhere. So it, it gets uh, much worse. So these are the SIO portfolios, just as I'm going to talk about the quintiles, I kept also the, the second SIO and the ninth SIO here. So you see that, you know, volatility is more or less the same, right? But returns increase a lot from, from the bottom up to the top, there's a, a very healthy uh, difference between top minus bottom here. Volatility is more or less the same. Once you do this top minus bottom, you get the correlation also helps and decreases a lot the volatility of the of this top minus bottom uh, portfolio. So it goes up to 12 and you get a, a very huge t statistic here. So these are for the fine alphas. You can do value weighted, more or less you get the same uh, the same thing. If you do by non parametric alphas, the results are not so rosy in some sense. So the average uh, return of this top minus bottom is much lower, it's, it's eight, but you know, volatility is more or less the same. Same, you had like 12 before, now it's 11. So you get a T statistic, which is still, you know, pretty decent, but not as uh, encouraging and promising and, and you know, enthusiastic as the other one. And once you do value weighted, it doesn't uh, work so well. So it really seems that uh, the small caps are doing uh, a big difference here. Okay, so here we have a subsample. So we, we split the sample in two. Results are essentially say that things are better after the crisis. So from 2010 to 2017, it works best. Here it doesn't work so well because essentially because of the crisis. If you if you end this first sample in 2008, then everything goes through beautifully. So it's essentially the 2008, 2010, where exactly you had these huge variations in the alphas that uh, is kind of damaging a little bit our shop ratio if you want. Okay. You can do that by holding period as well. And here you have from two days to up to five. And you can see that very quickly, the the average return that you get from this long short portfolio dies out to zero for the affine alphas, whereas they, they kind of keep positive for a number of days here, essentially because the, these non-parametric alphas have a better predictive power than, than the affine alphas. We also do some performance attribution. We look at these affine alphas and the non-parametric alphas, how they, what kind of exposure this uh, long short portfolio would get to this to the traditional 
risk factors we use. So here we have the five factors from a, from a, from a French plus momentum. You know, you, you could include other things as well, but and the, and the reversals. And you see that there's not much going on here. So some, uh, some of these, um, some of these uh, exposures are significant, but you know, in magnitude, they're, they're kind of. Well, I would maybe disagree with you, uh, giving you a table okay. there. Like, uh, one thing that I was uh, hoping that you talk about, like, what is was the relation between this and short term reversals? Um, because actually, my, the implication that I got from the results is kind of the opposite of short term reversals in some sense. Because you're, uh, you're saying that the alpha yesterday of a certain company is telling you something about the alpha tomorrow. And the short term reversals actually would tell you that actually would, the opposite would be happening. Because like if you control for residual, like identify residual performance of certain stocks, like, and there are papers about that, like uh, actually the good performers uh, yesterday would have poor performance the following day. Um, and actually I'm seeing a negative sign here. So it's actually in a strong negative relationship. So that line, I guess, is kind of important somehow. Uh, I, th I think they're important and they, they have some statistical significance. I just said the magnitude. It doesn't explain. It doesn't explain. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if you, if you want to, I can delve into this. So the affine alphas are essentially, you know, they, they're getting significant exposure to winning large caps. That's essentially what they're getting. And the, you know, you can see that there's a negative uh, SMB, so it's essentially large caps, and momentum is is positive, which kind of um, don't really contradict. But uh, you get a, you know, if if you translate momentum, short term reversal, and long term reversal into autocorrelations, what you get in the end, like with this uh, point twenty a positive. Uh, a positive exposure to momentum and a negative uh, exposure to short-term reversal. What essentially what you get is that uh, uh, in, the, in the overall, you're getting the winners. You still have exposure to the winners. If you look at the autocorrelation that this kind of, uh, uh, this would imply. So despite the fact that you have an, a very negative or, or significantly negative short-term revo for, for both of them, for both affine and non-parametric alphas, you're still getting the winners, you still have momentum. So momentum dominates here more than the, the short-term reversal. Mm -hmm. If you consider the, the, the implicit autocorrelation function that you would get from the moon. Because at the end of the day, that's what you're getting with momentum, short-term and long-term. It's just a, a kind of a, Kind of pattern that you are summarize pattern of that correlation function of cross out correlation function that you're summarizing with these three variables with three, three different uh, uh, horizons for the, this kind of things, and in the in the end of the day you're still getting a winner here. It's more important than the than the loser from the past day, whereas the non parametric uh, sorting is has much more exposure to. It's it's more diversified in terms of exposures than the one for the for the alphas. I think the only exception is the small caps that they're not appearing so much, and the R and the U, which I think is profitability rate. So one of the five factors. Yeah. So then we do all sorts of robustness checks, right? You know, like perhaps it's it's not really the alphas that are making the difference. So what happens if you do raw returns? Right, so and we know already that momentum that works only in a specific way. That you have to look at the guys from last year that were winning, or you cannot really do momentum at the high frequency. It doesn't work. You know, you really have to change a little bit how you do it. So it doesn't work. Actually, what you get is monotonically decreasing returns once you sort by raw returns. So there's a a lot of new reversal, especially and this is essentially driven by micro uh, uh, and small caps, but there's a lot of new reversion going on there. If you just do risk adjusted returns, so if you just take the return and subtract the risk premium exposure given by the conditional beta, it's still not enough, does not suffice. You still have monotonically decreasing return. So it's, it's essentially the, this, uh, the second step of, of estimating the conditional alphas 
that gives you the this uh, this long short uh, a positive return for this long short uh, strategy. We can exclude micro caps as well or sort into quintiles. And actually, sorting into should be quintiles here. And sorting into quintiles is actually makes our shock ratios even better. And uh, the reason is simple. If you look at the at these returns here, actually the, the highest, you know, like here you get 13, 13% instead of nine. So you get a, a much better uh, deal here than you get actually when you take the difference, you get a better deal here than you get here, especially for the non-parametric alphas. And then it works a little bit better if you use quintiles than if you use the size. We didn't want, as I said before, I didn't want to encourage into cherry picking, so we kept the deciles. We extract the micro caps as well, exclude them. Sharp, ra sharp ratios remain pretty decent, so uh, I'm not going to talk much about that. We did weekly and monthly conditional alphas. We, you know, kind of a placebo thing. We would expect this to, you know, like everything to die out because a uh, pricing error shouldn't be uh, lasting for so long. And that's exactly what we get. You know, you get slightly negative returns for their fine alphas and the shock ratios get, you know, pretty close to zero for the non-parametric alpha. So that's our kind of placebo. Trimming, as I said, does not affect much performance unless you do no trimming, then it's just really bad. Nor does adjusting the risk-free rates because obviously it's a cross-section uh, momentum uh, strategy. So let me wrap up because I think I, it took me a little bit more of time than, uh, than I planned. Uh, this is a novel approach to estimate pricing errors. So the focus here is in pricing errors, not really testing the, the model that you, an asset pricing model. It integrates high and low frequency data in what I think is a, is a clever way. We have flexible and robustness, you know, for this uh, conditional alphas because of this non-parametric character of the model. And the alphas are kind of predictable, but not much, which allows, you know, some degree of predictability. Asymptotic theory is not trivial. Uh, it, it, it took us, uh, you know, a year at least to, to, to wrap up and be happy, really happy with that. So there is this whole bunch of issues in terms of cursor dimensionality, the measurement error that you have to control for, and, and trimming is really paramount. So it took us a long time because we were not doing trimming and we couldn't understand why the simulations were not working uh, so well as we expected. And then trimming made a, a, a big difference. If you use a pressure ratio, which I didn't talk about, actually you don't need trimming. Because uh, there, once you, you divide by the disocratic risk, this already gives you the discipline you want. And empirically, what we show is that betting on the conditional alpha instead of the unconditional alpha actually pays off. And, and, uh, and I think this is an interest uh, interesting way to, to you know, to envision the paper, you know, like this, the difference between batting on conditional and unconditional versions of that. Thanks. Perfect. Um, any questions? I see that there's a question from Alex Ferreira here. Um, maybe I can uh, unmute you uh, so that you can ask the question directly. Trying to do it, <laughs> not working. I think I had I had to. Oh yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you very much, Marcelo, for the very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my question is: if if there is a strategy in which you can trade on alphas, wouldn't they disappear in equilibrium? Uh, so I mean, what what would be the explanation for, you know, this persistent? sort of mispricing would it be a sort of a i don't know imperfect information some i don't know uh some sorts of of child uh, or yeah. what 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 would I'll, be I'll give, kind of driving arbitrage away you know pre I'll, preventing I'll, arbitrage yeah i'll give you the short answer because the long the, the longer answer is going to take too much time so the short answer is that if you look at all these empirical factors that we have been uh, looking at since the, the 70s, 
you know, that's, that's the story about them, right? The, the story about smart beta against uh, looking for alpha and looking for a, a smart beta. It's essentially about that. People find new factors and we have about, I don't know, more than 3,000 factors nowadays that people have been looking at and uh, the factors do if you want. And they, and this is a kind of a smart beta that you can tap on for a couple of months. And then once people realize that there's this smart, this new factor out there, it normally disappears, right? There are very few factors that were robust to that, that uh, still give you some, uh, some positive alpha after all this time. So momentum is one of them. But uh, not even value is giving us this anymore. Size has disappeared a long time ago. I think that this is the short answer. And um, a longer version of, of, of the answer would go into the, to the fact that actually our pricing errors are, are very short lived and they're, they're staying there for, you know, after two or three days, we don't get any, any, anything out of it. So. And by the so way, I uh, do transaction costs when you compute that, no. Uh, we have one version with four bips and now we are producing a new version, which is going to take a long time because of the, the amount of stocks we're doing. Where essentially, instead of uh, imposing transaction costs, we reverse engineer it to see what would be the transaction cost that would kill the result. So, yeah, break even. But this is going, yeah, but this is going to take a, a bit of time. So anyway, it's uh, you know we know that uh, I think since the '80s we know that uh, if markets markets cannot be informationally efficient because otherwise nobody would have any any incentive to to do security analysis and suddenly you have a deviation from the such a, some mispricing and nobody would spot it, right? So markets have to be near efficient and that's what we have here, you know, like very short lived of the opportunities. Hope I answered your question, Alex. Uh, Alex. Any other questions? Um, if not, uh, I'd like to Thank Marcelo very much for a great presentation. Um, and just to finalize, I'd like to welcome everybody in a, in a couple of weeks to join us at the Miguel Sucho Portuguese uh, Encontro Brasileiro de Finanças. Um, uh, daqui a duas semanas, e por causa disso, a gente não vai ter é, sessão daqui a duas semanas. A gente volta é, no dia 31 com Bernard. É, 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 a gente manda aí, nas próximas semanas aí o convite para todo mundo. Talvez fosse legal compartilhar de novo a tela com. É, eu não tenho a tela a aqui. Programação. Eu, eu lançar isso, mas é, é, a informação toda está no site, tá? E, e a gente vai ficar compartilhando aí, aumentar a frequência de anúncios aí em LinkedIn, ah. Twitter, em Facebook nas próximas semanas. Tá? É, a gente tem um excelente lineup. Vai ser uma Conferência um pouco menor do que a média, o normal, mas dada a situação, a gente teve que se adaptar um pouquinho. É, e vai ser uma versão totalmente online, online, obviamente. Perfeito. Obrigado, Marcelo. Obrigado a vocês aí.